In the previous episode, I broke down what would make a good rival. Let's once again put my studies to the test and write my own Pokemon rival. When I did this with the villains, I was just fulfilling four character design points because this list, in my opinion, is all they needed to remain at least decent for Pokemon. That list being, what are their motivations, do their actions support their goals, do they have a soul in terms of a personality and a story arc, and what could the player learn from them? Do well in answering these questions and you have… not terrible characters. However, rivals need so much more than this. How do you avoid them becoming flat and repetitive in a game series where each sequel starts… basically the exact same story from scratch every time? The second criteria I have here is borrowed from the YouTube channel Design Doc as they broke it down very well. Premise. What is their story and why does it interact with yours? How do they contrast with the protagonist? Conflict. Does it make sense why they are against you? Is it challenging or interesting? Persistence. How do they progress compared to the player? Do they actively stand in the way? How often do we interact with them? Using these lists combined, I reviewed a few rivals over Pokemon's history. Some did very well, some did horribly, and what do you know, people tend to generally agree about what rivals they enjoyed and what they did not. So this list goes some way towards understanding why. Now at this point you might be inclined to ask, Damon, if we know this list is pretty solid, why go through this design exercise again for rivals? To which I'd respond, That is a fantastic question, thank you for asking, and by the way, thank you for subscribing to my channel. I don't have many subscribers and I really appreciate you taking the time to watch my series and leave comments. The reason to go another round is to show some mechanics, design, and storytelling elements that will support these design criteria. What I will bring up will be nothing brand new to the gaming industry, in fact, quite the opposite, but you'll be hard pressed to find them in a Pokemon game. In my previous videos where I concentrated on villains, I put forward the question, what could villains offer the world of Pokemon? So in this video, I'm going to ask, what could the world and mechanics of Pokemon offer the rivals? Let's take a look. An element that has always been noticeably missing in the Pokemon games is a more in-depth response to the player's actions both in and outside of battles. What I mean here is having NPC dialogue and even decisions they make based on the player's own choices and performance. Imagine if, after having beaten a rival, they had different dialogue based on how well you performed. If you only just scraped by the arrogant one might say something like, well I took it easy on you, and go on their way. However, if you basically wiped them out with just one Pokemon that took little damage itself, their response might be in greater shock and say, well that wasn't even my real team. Next time, I'll show you what I'm really capable of. Not only does their team grow in power to better match yours the next time you see them, but they might have a completely different setup to better counter your own. Or what if you faced your rival with a rare Pokemon or one from a trade, only for them to reply with a shocked, how did you get that? And maybe a bitter beaten rival will even comment that having such a rare Pokemon at this point was cheating. The games have gotten Better at this over the years, Sword and Shield had characters say slightly different dialogue based on how well the player had been filling out their Pokedex. Leon, the regional champion, skips the tutorial for how to catch Pokemon if you have already done so by the time he is scripted to bring it up. Hop, your rival in those games, even makes a comment about how you know your type matchup when you get a hit in with a type advantage against his team. Although he says that every single time you fight him, so it is not that great. These are really nice touches, but they fall vastly short of their potential. I very much enjoyed that they have stuff to say during the battles, and even when you are running around the world, people have little dialogue boxes that pop up saying things like, is that the champion? All cool and great, but it is still just the tip of the iceberg for what could be done here. A lot of trainers you come across still have pre-programmed things to say before and after battle that usually have little bearing on the environment or story. Also, this idea ties in well with narrative branching. What if the player has choices to make during the story and those choices have consequences? Pick any one of the games and everyone who played it goes through the same storyline. You are on this railroad and there is no way out before it. A combination of a little more open world, 
Branching story paths and responsive NPC conversations could really bring a lot of life into the Pokemon games, especially your rival. If they make decisions in response to the ones the player made, they are going to resonate in the player's mind more effectively. Another idea I want to throw out there is for different types of rivals. Every Pokemon generation has been putting the protagonist, a child, in a competition against other children, for world domination. Clearly there are other ways that could be refreshing. For the first time in the Pokemon series, Scarlet and Violet had one of your rivals actually be the regional champion. I thought this was fantastic. They introduced one of your end goals right at the start of the game when they introduced you to Nimona. They even had good reasons for why the battle against her are balanced. She is taking it easy on you, or she happened to not have her finest team on her at the time. All great stuff, but I think there is another approach we can take here too, and that is to put the player into a fight they can't win. Let's say you come across the champion, and as you talk, you have the option to battle them. They say, oh, you want to battle? I've got to warn you, I'm actually the league champion of this region. Are you sure you want to? You can say no and skip this battle, or any battle they offer, but upon saying yes, they would go, I'll tell you what, I'll use just one of my Pokemon. If you can beat it, I'll give you something nice. Don't worry if you lose, I'll heal them back up, and I won't take any money. Sure enough, that one Pokemon is level 50 plus or whatever, and will probably wipe the floor with you. Out of respect, they give you the nice thing anyway for the good battle, but could you imagine what it would be like to fight them again later? Finding out that that one Pokemon you battled earlier was of course their weakest one? How much would you be itching to do to them the same thrashing they gave you earlier? It would make for a real triumphant moment when you do finally beat them. Following the idea of something to compare your progress against over time, one thought I had was a legendary on a rampage. Early in the game, there's a newborn yet powerful Pokemon. Unfortunately, it's been captured and abused by humans, but you manage to free it from its torment. Despite being its savior, it still sees people as a massive threat to itself and flees from you. It goes on a battling spree over the course of the game, getting stronger and stronger, becoming a menace to all people throughout the region. Whenever you encounter it, it will 100% refuse any Pokeball, no matter if you do or don't defeat it, and no matter how many badges you have. It's only through the process of showing it that people and Pokemon can get along that it will finally calm down and maybe let you catch it. Nice moments between you and your Pokemon out in the grass might be secretly spied upon by the legendary. Perhaps it gets angered by what it sees and tries to free those Pokemon, only for them to come to your aid. Or perhaps it simply runs away conflicted as you notice it leaving the shadows. Either way, it gains challenging to fight levels, is persistent, and has a view that contradicts your own. Lastly, just before I get to writing my rival, there have been some mechanics I have mentioned in previous episodes that I will be using. Since you and your rival will be foiling a villainous organization together, here are some things to keep in mind. Villains don't follow the rules. Since these are evil people, there is money to be made, power to be gained. Why should they fight fairly? When going into battle against a grunt, they throw all their Pokemon out at once and carry more than six Pokemon on their person. Those dastardly crooks. But that's not all. The most sinister method they use? They steal Pokemon. They can actually steal your Pokemon. Keep in mind, we can make sure that no harm is ever really done. These are just ways we can make the player feel actually antagonized by our villains. Now, on to writing a rival. Let's begin with a very familiar setup with a boy your age from your hometown called Eli. Eli is kind-hearted, competitive, and is friendly to you and to Pokemon. However, he focuses too much on winning and not enough on just enjoying the game of battling between friends. You battle him after you get your first Pokemon and notice his rather passionate reaction whether he wins or loses. The plot marches on as usual, and you are soon introduced to Team Bad Guys. Just like in the Pokemon Red and Blue games, they offer you the chance to join them, and unlike in those games, this time you can actually consider their offer. These villains speak of how their high-ranking members actually have all eight badges, and how you could be next. Tempting, yes? It's at this point that your choices can start to change Eli's story arc. First, I'll show you what happens to him if you say yes, and then if you say no to joining Team Bad Guys. So, you've joined the villains. 
Eli, seeing this, says he doesn't need anyone's help to beat you, and walks away. You, meanwhile, find out pretty quickly how terrible they are after they take your Pokemon away and give you just a few Rattata in return, because you're not high enough rank for such quality Pokemon. This means that eventually you are going to betray them, because they keep screwing you over and giving you nothing in return. Of course, you'll be getting your Pokemon back in the process. The story continues on, and as you run into Eli, you notice he is becoming ever more obsessed with winning. Over time, he starts to make comments about how his Pokemon mustn't be strong enough, as they are prone to fainting often. Eli doesn't heal them between battles, but then says phrases like, you'll get a potion when you get more critical hits. A rather sour turn from his friendly beginnings. You both work together to take down the villains, although he might treat it more as a competition or race rather than as a good deed. Finally, on the way to the Elite Four, you catch him with his Pokemon around him and you see your rival being abusive, calling his Pokemon names, saying they are not good enough. Noticing you, he starts the battle. But this won't be a battle. Because Eli's Pokemon don't fight. Instead, they run away. One by one. So Eli's journey as your rival ends here, just before the Elite Four. He never challenges you again. You can find him back at his home, surrounded by the Pokemon that ran away, apparently successful in convincing them to give their trainer another chance. But he doesn't do battles anymore. Upon learning how wrong he was, Eli removed that which cost him his Pokemon, his drive to be the best. Perhaps Eli trades that dream in, wanting to be a better understudy for the professor, at least for the time being. Now, let's go the other way. This time, when Team Bad Guys offers you a deal too good to be true, you wisely say no. However, you can probably guess what Eli is about to do. He jumps at the opportunity, seeking the promise of power, and is sure that you aren't taking the chance just because you aren't dedicated enough to winning. The next time you see him is the next time you fight Team Bad Guys. Except now he has a completely different team of Radicates and Arbox. Sure enough, he throws them all out at once to try to gang up on you, as per any villain. But the way he looks, the way he talks, shows how miserable he is. The player again can see how awful Team Bad Guys are because Eli tells you how they took his Pokemon. He begins to cry, saying that he can't leave the team until he can figure out a way to get them back. It might be a gripping moment if, one of the times you fight him, he begs you to let him win since they promised to give me back my Pokemon if I stop you. If he loses anyway, it's another reason to hate you. If you throw the match and let him win, then he comes back too soon without any of the promised Pokemon, sadly claiming that they need him to beat you just one more time. When you get around to shutting down Team Bad Guys, sure enough, you find every one of Eli's Pokemon. Although Eli is a high-ranking member now, the villains keep his Pokemon hostage so as to keep him in line. Upon learning you have recovered them, he immediately joins your side and helps you destroy his tormentors. Eli could meet you later noticeably happier and offer to battle you, but this time, in contrast to his earlier attitudes, he specifies it is just for fun. When he loses, he would react almost happily, praising his Pokemon and commenting that he's just glad to have them back and that he never wants to risk them again. Well, this is interesting, but it's less narrative branching as it was more of just a narrative fork in the road. We can do better than this. Let's say there are another two major story beats for the bad guys after their introduction and offer. First is the offer to join, second is where they are enacting an evil plot to get more money, and third is when you defeat them in their hideout. This means that you and Eli will be on opposing sides during the evil plot depending on who joined them. However, a team bad guy player may decide they don't want to go along with this evil plot. Upon losing their Pokemon, they may decide to get them back immediately, and here we have our second narrative branch. You can work for or against the villains during their crime spree plot point, resulting in you either fighting for them against Eli, or working in a team with Eli to stop them. Let's look at if you decided to stay until after the evil plot for money. 
You are helping them to succeed, and Eli has come to stop you. You can see that he is pretty formidable, but during the battle, he makes comments about how miserable you look without your original Pokemon. Perhaps you should do something about that. Perhaps soon you will. When you do eventually return to the good side, Eli's story continue as described before. You see him growing more obsessed with winning and becoming abusive towards his Pokemon. It's this choice of sticking around with the villains that leads to the moment where Eli loses his Pokemon. So what happens when you leave early? If you have already left Team Bad Guys when they enact their evil plan, then you and Eli can work together against them. This means that their plot is foiled pretty swiftly, and they become desperate and vengeful. The villains attempt to ambush you and steal one or more of your Pokemon, and they really could do it if you're not careful. Regardless of how well you perform, they are successful in kidnapping Eli's Pokemon. He comes to you crying, begging for your help, and when you go to find them during the final act, the bad guys will comment about how easy they were to beat because even they could tell that Eli was pushing them too hard. Poor things looked almost relieved when we took them and healed them up. Once you have defeated the villains and recovered all stolen Pokemon, like before, Eli is grateful to have them back. He only battles for fun and not for winning. Well, this is looking better. However, I think we can do one more branch. Eli has proven that he is a bad trainer. He doesn't mean to be, he doesn't actually want to be, but the player may decide that upon recovering his stolen Pokemon, either due to him joining the villains or by having them stolen when he wasn't taking care of them, that they should not be returned to him. If you choose this path, then Eli would confront you and swear that I will take them from you before walking away. On your way to the Elite Four, shortly after the professor calls you to say that their Master Ball was stolen, you find Eli standing there waiting for you, Master Ball in hand. If there were any optional legendaries you had yet to catch since the last time you saw Eli, and we could easily design the map so that that would definitely be the case, then you will find them curiously missing from their spots, and Eli will have an interesting offer. He has captured those legendaries, and he will use them in battle against you if you don't return his Pokemon. He promises to release the legendaries to the wild if you do so, leaving you free to continue your work as an understudy. The choice is yours. But either way, it ends here and now. Now, I'm sure that the clever ones among you will be able to spot some plot holes here and there, like, what if you released his Pokemon once you got them, but didn't tell him about it? There is plenty of room here for story branching and ways to engage with Eli for the player, but I'll leave that to your imagination as it is time to move on to the review. Sorry, I really could keep writing stuff, but I need to move on. Let's run through our character checklist. What are their motivations? To be the best like no one ever was, and I apologize for that. Although it is not necessarily a want to be the champion, becoming the champion is simply a way to know that he has won the game, essentially. However, upon losing his Pokemon, that goal gets dropped immediately in favor of getting them back. They are what he actually treasures and cares about. Do their actions support their goals? Yes, to start with, he pushes himself and his Pokemon overly hard in order to improve. When he loses them, every single thing he does works towards what he believes is the best way to get them back. Although Eli's journey is very different depending on your actions, there is one special trigger in his personality that happens. He only realizes how much he loves his Pokemon when they leave or are taken from him. His dream to become the very best goes with them, and his new goal is to get them back at any cost. Do they have a soul in terms of a personality and a story arc? At the start, he has a light and happy demeanor, but as his fixation on winning grows, so does his attitude sour. Losing his Pokemon shows him at the depths of his despair, and getting them back returns him to his happy demeanor although greatly matured. His story arc from start to finish is that he would actually do anything for his Pokemon, even stop battling altogether. What can the player learn from them? I would hope that in any direction the player takes, they learn from Eli that the pursuit to be the best can rob you of the very thing that made you want to compete in the first place. Fun. Moving to our second set of questions for our rival filter, Premise. What is their story, and how do they contrast with the protagonist? 
Eli specifically chooses the path or paths you don't take out of a misguided attempt to fulfill their goals to either win above all else or to get his Pokemon back. Either way, his story should contrast with the player forming loving, caring bonds with their Pokemon. Conflict. Is it challenging or interesting? It definitely makes sense. Either he's forced to fight you by the villains, or he gets caught in the spiral of always trying to outdo you, and himself. Whether that's challenging or interesting, well, I like to think so. In terms of challenge, this depends on the path you take, because in the timeline where he joins the villains, his Pokemon get taken. In this, he could fall rather short of a challenge because he is being held back, only becoming a challenge again later when they are returned to him. Persistence. Absolutely. Eli's story arc has him reacting to many of your own story beats, and narratively he has a strong motivation to continuously face you. The trick to making sure facing him wasn't annoying or hard to relate to, I think, would just be a matter of striking that balance of how many times you battle him and how well his script is written. So, Eli fits all our criteria. Does that make him a great rival? There is no guarantee of that. It all comes down to execution in gameplay. At the very least, we could make sure that he has the best chance possible by running through this list. I hope you enjoyed Eli as a character, or if you didn't, he does display rather revolting behaviour at points, that he at least made for an interesting rival. Let me know in the comments how you would go about designing your own rival. Again, thank you for watching, and thank you to those that subscribed just to make my Wulu happy. Next episode is the last one of my Pokemon design study, so in the meantime, if you could please share my videos around and all that good stuff. Continue to be wonderful, and I'll see you then.